Hey guys, it's Olivia Blake, and this is me not writing. So I put on the most Regan dress I could find. There are naked ladies all across it. And I'm here to, well, largely to tell you that Alone With You in the Ether is back. I, I was just sending an email to my tour publicist about how I am, I'm more vulnerable when it comes to this book um, than probably I will ever be again, and certainly more so than any other of my books. So I've been warning everyone that like, when I promote this, I'm going to cry at every single event. It's gonna be deeply emotional. Um, but like, you know, everything is fine. Everything is fine. Yeah, no. So, okay, I, I have it here. I have the US version, which I think is super cute. Like I, I actually love, I love the spine, especially. I notice it catches my eye on my bookshelf and it, it, it excites me. I mean, because it's, because it's me. Um, but yeah, here's a comparison with the UK version. So here's a little size comparison. The backs are slightly different, spines slightly different. Um, UK version is very shiny though because the UK knows how to sparkle. I also have, this is a prototype of the, um, the Illumicrate version, which is really cool. It's got this on the inside and it's like a naked hardcover, which is really, it's really exciting. But mine, they were testing the colors and mine is basically a journal. So I'm gonna write down my thoughts and dreams. Okay, uh, so anyway, I know, you know, we're gonna have this conversation one more time very briefly. No, I cannot sell you the original paperback. It really isn't, was not looking that good. I've seen now a lot of the like later printed versions and they were just really washed out, not at all the color I intended. I actually, I um, I think I mentioned once on Twitter super briefly that when I was designing the cover for Alone With You In The Ether, I chose the colors based on a painting that I thought would be um, one that Regan would particularly like. It's a John Singer Sargent painting. And I drew the color, like extracted it straight from there. So it is a sort of, like it's an, it's an interesting shade. It is intended to be sort of like a, like a purple, like it's supposed to be purple. Um, in some pictures it looks gray or pink, um, but that's what it is. And uh, yeah, so that cover's gone. It's honestly not that great. <laughs> I know you guys always want what you can't have, but it, like it was a nice cover, um, but it, you know, it was, it was more that it was uh, something that I was trying to say with the sparsity. I purposely wanted to create a cover that was pretty plain and then give it a spine that was more visually interesting. Um, oh, I forgot that currently right now, this is sitting on top of uh, two editions. So this is the um, Waterstone special edition and this is the international exclusive edition. I'm just gonna go right back under my, under my laptop. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, but that is not available anymore for like a lot of different reasons. There are some amazing special editions coming out. So if for whatever reason you don't like the new version, you can get one of the special editions. It's great. Um, I, I really don't, I can't imagine like some of the prices that the original paperback is going for and then that arrives and you see it and you're like, oh yeah, this is totally worth whatever. No, it's not. It, trust me, it's not. I'm not just saying that. Although I will say, um, because I'm am, I'm am in the midst of, like publishing time is so weird. I'm already in the midst of working on the marketing and stuff for One For My Enemy. And I will tell you, I am so excited for the new versions of One For My Enemy and Masters of Death. I'm actually doing copy edits on Masters of Death right now. Um, I've just seen Lil Kimura's newest illustrations for it. Um, I don't think I've announced here yet that Poe on Twitter and Instagram and Tumblr, lots of places, I'll link it. Um, so she's Pole Arts, uh, which if you remember that amazing Libby Parisa illustration, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing that I'm never gonna sleep again. This is my life now. And then when my editor said like, hey, what do you think about, since these are sort of special editions, getting an additional artist, so Lil Morris still does new, exciting, like, oh my God, amazing interior, interior illustrations. If you followed Lil Kimura and me for a long time, then you probably know that both of us have kind of 
found our style at this point. Little Cora does those like amazing little doodles and they add an extra like hidden meaning. It's not that hidden, but like kind of to the art, which is like speaks like, I don't know. To me, it's just it's just such a kinship between my writing and her art. But anyway, and they were like, what do you think about finding additional artists? So I was so excited to get to work with Laura um, of Last Draws for One For My Enemy. It's just that she has such a dreamy style and it's so like ethereal and kind of surreal and it works so beautifully for that like fairy tale retelling. Um, and then Masters of Death, um, it's just... <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you, it's really hot. It's just a really hot illustration. <clears throat> so anyway, my point is, if you have never like, if you have are, are reading my stuff for the first time, please don't waste your time trying to source a uh, used paperback. Like just believe me when I tell you that the new versions are so much better on every possible level. Like yes, I have an emotional attachment to the original covers. I am talking to Lil Kimura about um, the covers that she illustrated doing like print versions so that if you wanted to have those just, you know, for looks, you could get a print or something. Um, but like aside from nostalgia, the new versions are better in every conceivable way. So please, please. I'm no longer circulating posts that feature the old versions. Like I love, I, I can tell the difference between someone who has bought a used old version and someone who has had it for a long time. Just trust me, I can tell the difference. Um, and it just means a lot more to me if you are, you know, just just being introduced to my stuff and are just trying to read, like, please read the new versions. I worked so hard. <laughs> I worked so hard, <laughs> okay? I have had, I mean, you know, I am obviously so grateful, but I've had an incredibly busy year and I have slept basically not at all. And I have done a lot of work and you know, whatever. You don't need to hear this. This is my vlog, so like, I'm just talking to myself really, but um, I worked really hard. I've written a lot of additional scenes. And, well, not additional scenes, but um, I've like really worked in more of my current voice into the previous versions of scenes. So like, you know, improving descriptions of things and, and changing the dialogue a little bit so that it sounds more like <laughs> an author wrote it. Um, but you know, the, for one for my enemy and masters of death, um, the plot is still the same. I just took some time to lean in heavier on some of the emotional scenes and got to really live in that interiority in, in more devastating ways. Um, made some new jokes too. <laughs> um, Alone with You in the Ether is the same except for typos. So, you know, if you've already read the original version, you probably know why I, I didn't really want to make any changes. Pretty much nothing changed except that I had spelled Mark's name wrong, which was a real bummer for me. And then, you know, with the Atlas Six, uh, those, if you're, if you're still not sure, you should read the new version of the, the tour version of the Atlas Six because I did um, do a lot of reconstruction on part eight. So part eight is very different from the self-published version. So, which is not to say like, you know, go out and buy it right now if that's not conceivable for you to do. I mean, obviously, thank you to those of you who did that. Um, but I would recommend at least reading part eight. This is something I've repeated many times. Um, okay, I just had a couple of things that I wanted to talk about, I think. I did have, like I have some things in my Tumblr inbox, but like, you'll see, you'll see. Okay, so one thing I wanted to talk about really briefly, um, because I feel weird about participating in conversations like this on, on Twitter, where I feel like people are sort of excited uh, to take things in bad faith. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Book Talk article that was on The Cut, which like, I love The Cut, I love The Cut, um, talking about how white Book Talk is. Um, and I'm not sure, okay, I'll be honest, I didn't read it <laughs> because because I feel like I've been pretty consistent in my messaging. I've been interviewed a lot about book talk and what it has done for my career and what I think about it. And um, I have sort of repeatedly said that 
Book talk is essentially the same thing that has always sold books, which is word of mouth. But uh, because you can reach people on this sort of astronomical scale, because the For You page algorithm works so well, um, and it's got such a like beautifully tailored infinite scroll, like it's you're you're able to reach so many more people. The propensity to go viral is so much higher. So when people are really enthusiastic about a book, you can reach. So such a bigger audience. And I am obviously enormously grateful for what ha that has done for my career. But I also noted that like, I, I specifically, I did an interview that was like, I probably a year ago now where I was like, okay, but part of like the thing with book talk though, is that you are still relying on an algorithm. So it's not so much the authors or the books themselves that are furthering the algorithm, but the people whose faces are talking about the books. Um, I think that even, a, I think a couple of years ago now, I know this is really bad because I can't remember which brand it was. I think it was a beauty brand. They came out and said right away that um, their stuff goes viral if they have a thin, conventionally pretty, like Western beauty standard person as the feature. And that if they have someone that's plus sized or darker skinned, then something, something about those videos don't go viral. Um, and it's something that like the algorithm seems to purposely hold back. And I, I've never like, I, that's just something that I think about, you know, so that I don't think it's that people are only talking about white authors. I think that the algorithm favors a certain type of demographic by which I do mean young, pretty, skinny white women, which like the world kind of already tends to favor. Um, and I think that that like, it's a kind of a not, it's more like a, if we're not careful, then those people, that's who publishing is gonna reach out to, to be like, read this book and help us sell it. Because I promise you publishing is doing their best to crack TikTok. I don't know how successful they're going to be. I think that there is a very like, distinct difference between someone who genuinely loves a book and someone who has been gifted the book and is creating an ad. Um, I think that like this generation of social media users particularly is aware of that and that like authenticity is something that we can smell. <laughs> but yeah, so my, my thought is essentially like I'm not pointing fingers or anything um, except maybe at TikTok. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't done, I have not run the requisite studies. This is just something that I remember seeing and it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. Lots of algorithms are racist and uh, favor certain you know, types of attractiveness over others. Um, and it is still a business. We're still slaves to capitalism. So like, I don't think you could, I don't think you could make the argument that there is no bias in the algorithm is what I'm saying. And so I think that if we are always reading what publishing thinks young, pretty white women read, then we might get kind of trapped into the same types of books. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that uh, like the, basically all I want to come away with here is, is, you know, read diverse books. <laughs> I hope, I hope that, I mean, I personally, whenever I go to my events, I am, I feel so comforted by the diversity in the room, by seeing so many women of color and occasionally men, which is shocking to me. I don't know how they found their way there, but like, welcome. And, and you know, so when I'm, when I'm real life sitting with my audience, I feel very comforted by the kinds of people and the variety of people who enjoy my books, but I can see how it might look different on social media. So anyway, my takeaway uh, is that um, I didn't read the article. But but it wouldn't surprise me if the uh, platform favors a certain look. Just read a lot. <laughs> uh, plus, like, I think lots of people have made really, like, sensible arguments that, of course, people want to pick up the books that other people are talking about. There's lots of times when I've thought, why aren't more people talking about this book? I say that all the time about Fault Lines by Emily Atami. But, you know, like, mm, I... I Let's just continue to do what we do best, which is force our reading tastes onto other people, but not criticize people for their reading tastes. Because you know what? Reading is so personal. I'm just gonna keep, you know what? What else are we doing here except listening to me babble? Reading tastes are 100% personal because it is communion between you and another human being. It's between you and the author, and you are having a moment together. And it is so 
intimate. Like those of you who have read my entire my entire Oprah are like, you know more about me than my mother will ever know. I'm well, like you know, she's read all my books too, but it's different. So, um, you know, there's something so vulnerable about that, and I think it's what makes us, it's what drives us to be so mean about books we don't like. I think sometimes, um, and also what makes us love the books that we do love. Like Alone with You in the Ether, I am very scared of the negative reviews that I know are coming because I know this book is not for everyone. I know that I didn't write it for everyone. I didn't write it thinking this is going to be commercially successful. I wrote it because I needed to put words to the feeling of of being someone who does not believe that they're lovable um, and, and learning to love anyway. I wanted to write about the terror of love. I wanted to write about how afraid of love I was um, and how afraid uh, I was that I wasn't going to be worthy of it ever. Um, or that if I did find someone that I, that I did love deeply, that the whole thing would be, you know, tainted by how badly I didn't want them to leave. I think one of the truest lines in Alone with You in the Ether is when she when she asks herself, am I always going to be half of a whole? Am, is, is the power going to always be in balance that I am so desperate for him not to leave that I will become whatever he wants me to be? Um, and, you know, and, and so I wrote it from a place of terror. <laughs> And so there are going to be people who say that it doesn't speak to them and good. <laughs> I, like if you're not afraid and love, then congratulations. I'm so happy for you. <sighs> Mazel. No, but really, I, it, it, it is, it is um, not about my love story, but it is about my brain in many ways. And um, I am grateful and I'm honored that there are those of you who think that it's it speaks to you in, in, in the kind of way that I intended, in the communion way that I intended, that we are sitting together and holding hands and um, really looking each other in the eye and confessing some darkness. <laughs> Let's see what's in my what's in my oh also I did not cut my hair because my um my my person who cuts my hair uh told me that I I shouldn't cut it short yet while I still have like hair loss that I'm dealing with and while I was traveling a bunch so next year next year um so we're gonna we're gonna go long first and then we'll chop it I know you guys are really invested in the state of my hair okay I I only remember one thing in my inbox and I remember that I read it it's very long sorry I got distracted so there's a very long there's a very long ask here some big sis ring about someone who has fallen for their friend and I okay I don't want to give you the impression that I don't care about all the specifics it's there's a lot of specifics um but I feel like you basically, I feel like you basically have to make the choice. Am I going to hyperactively analyze every single thing that this person says or does? And am I, am I going to allow what I perceive to be the meaning of their actions to influence the way that I feel and how I go on about my day? <laughs> um, I should remind you once again, I don't have any water sign placements. I'm just like an air and fire sign, like all the way down. I'm also, a, I'm also a Virgo rising, which actually I think the Virgo might be the problem here. The Virgo in me is like, this is, this is too many extraneous details. Like, no, it's not the Virgo. The Virgo would be taking notes on those things. Let's be real. Um, so it's the Aquarius then being like, we don't, we, YOLO. Life is short. We can't just sit here and analyze what this person does, okay? So I think you either have to make the decision that like, yes, you're going to try to read into everything they're doing, in which case I'm not the person to read into it with because A, I can't interpret the actions of someone I don't know, especially if they're being delivered to me through the lens of yet another person I don't know. So like, I would have to know a lot more about you and them in order to decide like, oh yeah, that feels like the right behavior for them. Sadly, I am not, unlike Elam Nova, I am not a very talented empath. Well, all of, and all of which, all of which, here she, here she is, she's leaning back in her chair. All of which it goes to say, um, people are always submitting to me the details of their situation, thinking that I'm gonna have a different answer. And I think you even said like, you always say to just go for it. And it's true, 
I always say just go for it and here is why. Because I don't think that a friendship where one of you like is actively rooting for a romantic end game is a very good friendship. I think that um, like there's basically a lot that's going unsaid between you uh, that I think can can be romantic at certain times. Uh, certainly I have written friends to lovers in certain ways. Um, but usually there's an aspect of like idiocy to it where like both the people who are in love are not super good at uh, being aware of it. Um, I feel like if you are genuinely pining, that you are aching over your feelings for this person, what friendship could you possibly have that would be satisfying to you? This is very confusing to me. I feel the same way about media that's friends to lovers too. Like I cannot, I cannot get behind uh, Bridgerton season three. I haven't watched season two yet. This is not because I'm not interested. I've heard the pining is excellent. It's because I have a child who doesn't sleep. Still doesn't sleep. If you, like, he's 18 months old now and he still can't sleep longer than maximum four hours by himself. So like, ow! If your answer is not sleep training, then please help me. If your answer is sleep training, then like, it's too late. I can't do it. I can't hear my child cry. I can't, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It turns out I'm deeply tender hearted and I cannot do it. This is my one child, you know, like I, the world is gonna make him feel like shit every single day of his life, like very soon. I don't want to not be there when he cries. I can't do it. Okay, I'm yelling, I'm yelling. My husband is gonna tell me that I was yelling this whole time and he probably had to watch Frozen just to like, drown out the sound of me and my emotions, which I have, which brings us back to this question. I just feel like, you know, if this were happening where, um, if this were happening in the reverse, uh, like if, if this were a guy that was just waiting for you to notice him and was like reading your signs and he was being like, oh, I'm being totally friend zoned by this girl. Like you'd be like, this is stupid, right? Just tell her how you feel. This is stupid, tell them how you feel. I understand, I understand that it feels vulnerable, I do. But I think for me, I'm just a very utilitarian person and for me, like weighing the pros and cons. So are you just gonna be in this relationship forever just like wondering when he's gonna notice you? That sounds like so much misery. That sounds like way more misery than just telling him straight up how you feel or just gently asking him how he feels. That's usually ineffective. He'll usually poke you into saying it. I don't know. I just don't, I, I can't live a life that's, I don't know, a life of falseness. I can't. This is why I write books about how I feel for a living. For a living. And not even well, according to some people on the internet. So anyway, I wish you the best of luck with this though, because I get it. Because there is nothing more like calamitous than love. available now. <laughs> I think I'm going to try to do another one of these before I go away for the holidays. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I haven't discussed yet. Um, what am I reading currently? Uh, Victoria Lee, the author of A Lesson in Vengeance, uh, suggested I read Vita Nostra. So I'm reading that. If you are into Dark Academia, put that on your list, according to Victoria Lee, who also writes Dark Academia. Um, she promised me that it was so mind fucky that she was nauseated for a while. So like, that's what I'm here for. That's what I love. I love nausea. Oh, I'm so excited that I get to read the next Catriona Ward. I talked about her enough that her editor finally sent me um, a, a copy of her next book, Looking Glass Sound for a blurb. Yay me, the dream. Um, I also get to read Alex E. Harrow's next, which is super exciting. I love Alex E. Harrow. If you haven't read, I actually think that like, if you're looking for a light, like make me feel better about the world kind of read, A Mirror Mended and um, A Spindle Splintered, I think those are what they're called. Uh, the Fractured Fables. Um, they're novellas, they're great. Pick them up over the holidays. If you are looking to escape your family over the holidays and you wanna read something that's, very queer, then I always suggest Kat Sebastian. She always makes me feel better about the world. Um, and she just came out with a new one. I think, is it Daniel Cabot now? Um, I love the Cabot books, but I'm not good at the titles. I, I also pre-ordered it, so it's just like sitting there waiting, waiting for me to be done with, I just turned in book three, uh, the first revision. 
So we're not quite to the, the final substantive version yet. So I just finished one revision, they'll give it back to me, and then I have another month in January to revise it again, and then we submit it, and then we do copy edits and um, first pass, no, line edits, copy edits, first pass, uh, and then it goes out into the world and like first thing 2024, which I know sounds like a really long time away. I know it sounds that way, um, but it's only because I like murdered everyone in my uh, in production at tour between The Atlas Six and The Atlas Paradox. There were only six months between those books, which is like nuts. Like it's crazy. The fact that they even did that is a testament to me being like, desperate to please the audience who had been waiting for two years. I felt horrible. And um, when they wanted to re-release the Atlas Six, I think they initially wanted more time to do it so that I would have more time to write Paradox. Um, and I was like, no, could we do it faster? So yeah, we did it as fast as we humanly could. And now we have like a pretty normal lead time. So you basically have to wait about a year, a little over a year, um, but that's very normal. It's what you would normally wait for other books. Um, and it exists at this point, it's enough on the page that if something, you know, if something terrible happens to me, you'll still get the book. Um, in case you missed it, it's called The Atlas Complex. Um, she is thick. Uh, she is beautiful. Uh, you won't get to see the cover for a while, but I assure you, she is. Um, she is full of emotions. And what else can I say? Uh, yeah. So anyway, so I have that. I'm doing copy edits on Masters of Death right now. Um, I'm going to be at the Guadalajara Literary Festival on Friday, and then I'm taking a little bit of time off to be, you know, with my family and do some stuff. Um, coming in January next year, we're going to do a new anthology. So if you read, uh, if you read, the answer you are looking for is yes, this is an anthology of the stories that I wrote over the years for Which Way Magazine. And um, I also wrote several stories for them in 2020, and we're gonna combine those into an anthology as well. Um, and, and potentially with a new story, I hope, I hope I have time. That's gonna come out on my birthday, January 31st. And then we have One for My Enemy in April, um, Masters of Death in August. Uh, it's somewhere in there, The Alone With You in the Ether paperback sometime next year. Um, and then, yeah, and then like right after that, You'll blink and it'll be here, The Atlas Complex. And then Twelfth Night, uh, my other young adult book. Oh yeah, a reminder, you should know this. If you're watching this, you know this. But a reminder that Olive Blake does not write YA. Olive Blake only writes for adults. Alexine Farrell Fulmouth, the author of My Mechanical Romance, who is also me, um, she writes for young adults. Uh, so that's the difference. <laughs> fine. Anyway, um, I don't know that you guys took anything from this, but I was here. You were here. Oh, I'm, I am so, I'm so, 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 so behind. Uh, how do you know if you like your friend romantically versus platonically? This is the same person who is asking me about their friend they're clearly in love with. So I think they probably have the answer to that. I think the difference between liking your friend romantically and platonically is what you want out of that relationship. If you just want to continue things as they are, then I assume the friendship is good it's good with you. And if you want it to escalate to a place of, I don't know, marriage certificate or sex, I think we should all be a little bit in love with our friends. Um, I think that it's significant to feel slightly romantically towards your platonic friendships. But in the end, it comes down to your choice of what does that person mean to you and what do you want out of that relationship? And if what you want out of that relationship is to continue hanging out and trading secrets and, and talking about your dreams and looking at the stars, like then the relationship is uh, as it is. And if what you want is to like, I don't know, pin them against the wall with your sword and make out, You're probably not friends. You're welcome. Um, anyway, it has been a joy. It has been a joy to be here. Um, thank you. Alone with you and the ether is back in the world. This has been me, Alvi Blake, not writing, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>